Okay, so this is joint work with Ali Jalali and Pradeep Ravi Kumar, and uh, we all hail from UT Austin. Okay, so what do we mean by high-dimensional sparse inverse covariance estimation? Well, assume that we have p random variables x1 through xp, and assume they're distributed according to some zero mean Gaussian distribution parameterized by a covariance matrix sigma. Uh, further suppose that the inverse covariance matrix associated with this distribution is sparse. And by that, I mean that the number of off-diagonal non-zeros is small. Okay, then given n observations, x1 through xn, such that the number of observations is much smaller than the number of random variables in the distribution, our goal is to estimate the off-diagonal non-zero entries of the inverse covariance, ex uh, inverse covariance matrix, which we'll often denote by theta star. Okay, so what we would like to do? Ideally, what we would like to do is we would like to solve a sparsity-constrained maximum likelihood estimation. And so that's given right here. And uh, as you can see, it places an L0 constraint on the size of uh, theta star, so the number of non-zero uh, uh, elements. And uh, so this is a non-convex problem due to this L0 constraint, and so we can't quite do this. So we need to think of ways to circumvent this. I'd also like to point out here that uh, this sigma hat n is the sample covariance matrix. So some of you might be thinking right now, well, why don't we just stop here? We have this sample covariance matrix. Why don't we just stop there, call this our covariance matrix, and be done with it? Well, in the high dimensional setting, this will uh, most often fail, as can be easily shown. So uh, this is not a good estimate. <coughs> OK, so this problem can also be looked at as a structure learning problem for uh, Gaussian Markov random fields. <coughs> So every Gaussian distribution can be represented by a pairwise undirected graphical model or a Gaussian Markov random field. And so by that, we mean that we have a graph G with a vertex set corresponding to the random variables in our distribution and a sparse edge set. Remember, we're dealing with uh, sparse models here. So we have a sparse edge set and the edges correspond to the off-diagonal non-zero entries in the inverse covariance matrix. So equivalent to estimating the non-zero values in the inverse covariance matrix, uh, we can equivalently estimate the sparse graph structure or the edges in our model uh, given a high dimensional set of observations. So again, I just want to reiterate that uh, the number of observations n is much smaller, often orders of magnitude smaller than the number of uh, random variables in our distribution, which is we denote by p. Okay. So let's look at some previous methods of how this has been solved. So the first we'll look at, which uh, many of you have already seen, is the graphical lasso or the G lasso. So G lasso circumvents that L, uh, that L0 non-convexity by uh, imposing a, an L1 relaxation. Uh, so if we denote here uh, the L1, uh, uh, L1 regularization of the off-diagonal uh, elements by this, then uh, essentially we're solving Gaussian MLE with an L1 regularization. Okay, so this is a convex problem. It's a log determinant program and can be solved using coordinate descent or interior point methods. So here we have a graph structure with three nodes and globally using this optimization, it will solve the full structure of the model. Okay, so the second method uh, that I want to look at is that of neighborhood lasso. So similar to G lasso, uh, this is using uh, L1 regularization. However, uh, rather than estimating the global model, what neighborhood lasso does is for each uh, random variable individually, it's going to estimate the neighborhood uh, and according the loss it's going to use for that is going to be an L1 regularized sample-based least squares loss. Okay? So what it will do is it'll begin with node 1 and it'll estimate its neighborhood, then node 2, then node 3, and then it'll combine these neighborhoods for our overall uh, structure estimate. Okay, so let's look at some analysis of the lasso methods. By the sample complexity, what we mean is the number of samples that are sufficient in order to learn the structure of the model with high probability. So the graphical lasso uh, is shown to require order d squared log p samples, and neighborhood lasso improves on this a bit uh, for a bound of d log p. Uh, by min non-zero values, we're referring to the minimum values allowed uh, on the off-diagonal uh, L entries in the inverse covariance matrix, or the weights of the edges, okay? So as you can see, neighborhood lasso somewhat improves upon G lasso in the minimum allowed values, okay? Uh, so uh, model restrictions uh, both require e-representability, so let's look at the model restrictions of the lasso. Okay, so this is the e-representability condition represented algebraically, 
So what does this all mean? Well, let's let S be the support of our true edge set and S complement be the non-edge terms. Then gamma star here, you can think of this as being basically an edge-based counterpart to the node-based covariance matrix. So it's sort of the covariance between possible edges in the model, okay? So what e-representability is, is basically saying is it's placing an upper bound or imposing a control on the influence of the non-edge terms to the edge terms. So this is the sort of graph structure that uh, often uh, will not meet e-representability. So we have this uh, green node here and this red node over here. They share a lot of neighbors in common. So there is no edge between the green and the red node, but this non-edge uh, imposes influence on the edge terms in the graph. So this will often fail with the lasso methods. Okay, so greedy methods for structure learning. There's actually a rich history um, for greedy methods with structure learning. Uh, some of the original structure learning methods were greedy, but uh, the classic greedy methods were often deemed intractable. They were very slow. Uh, they didn't quite work in practice. Um, but there's actually been a recent resurgence of greedy. Uh, Zhang, uh, Tong Zhang in 2009 showed a forward greedy algorithm, uh, sparsistent or consistent in uh, model selection recovery uh, for sparse linear regression under irrepresentability. He then showed uh, that a forward backward greedy algorithm to be sparsistent for sparse linear regression under restricted eigenvalue condition, which is a weaker condition than your presentability. And then Jalali et al. in NIPS 2011 showed a forward backward greedy algorithm sparsistent for general nonlinear models, so not just sparse linear regression under restricted strong convexity. Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, two new methods. So the first method I want to introduce is the global greedy method. So the global greedy method you can think of as the greedy counterpart to G-Lasso. And basically, it's a very simple algorithm. We estimate the graph structure through a series of forward and backward stage-wise steps, okay? So the forward steps are simply choosing the best new edge to add to our model. We begin with an empty graph, and one by one, we're gonna choose the best new edge. And what do we mean by best new edge? We'll look down here at our loss. We're just choosing the best new edge according to the Gaussian MLE uh, loss, okay? So uh, at each point, we choose the best new edge, and as long as the decrease in loss, which we're going to denote by uh, delta FK, exceeds our stopping criterion, which is a parameter, okay, a tuning parameter, epsilon S, then we're going to add it to our graph. As soon as that does not happen, we stop and we return the model. For each forward step, we also need to perform backward steps. In the backward step, we choose the weakest current edge, okay, weakest again according to this loss. And if the weakest current edge, if uh, removing it from our model, yields an increase in loss that's greater than the product of the backward step factor and the decrease in loss due to the previous forward step, then we're going to remove it from the model. So the reason we need the backward steps is we need to be adaptive. We could make mistakes. At one point in the model, we could choose the best edge, but later in the model, this edge is no longer needed. Okay, so that's why we need to be adaptive and have these backward steps. So if you look at the model here, if this is our current estimate at some point in time, then we may perform a forward step. Here, choose the best next edge. Uh, it meets our criterion, so we add it. Then we'll choose the weakest edge because we need to perform a backward step, remember? Here it is, and it's chosen to be removed. Okay, so uh, something I just want to touch on a little bit is that uh, in choosing the best new edge, uh, we need to look at all possible edges. So at the beginning of the model, you know, all uh, P choose two possible edges, and we need to only perform uh, a single variable optimization. So this is very fast single variable optimization. And furthermore, because these optimizations don't depend on each other, they can all be done in parallel. So this is very fast. Okay, so the second method I want to introduce is that of neighborhood greedy. So you can think of neighborhood greedy as the, the greedy counterpart to neighborhood lasso. So similarly, uh, we're going to estimate each node's neighborhood, and we're going to do that in parallel. And we're going to do it by forward and backward steps. Again, we're going to use uh, a different loss here. We're going to use a sample-based least squares loss. And it's the same thing. We're going to perform forward and backward steps, choosing the next best parameter and the weakest parameter during the backward step. Okay? So if this is our model to begin with, uh, we'll start with this node here in the center, mm -hmm. the red node, and we'll try to learn its neighborhood. So we perform a forward step. It gets added. We need to perform a backward step. Uh, decides not to remove it. So we go back to another forward step. It gets added. Backward step, doesn't get removed. Forward step, ah, we broke. So that's decided to be the neighborhood for this node. We move on to another node and we would do something similar. And then as soon as we've gotten all the neighborhoods, we would combine them together and that's our structure. 
Okay, so I want to go through a little bit of an example of the global greedy method, going back to the global greedy method. So again, this is the kind of structure that uh, would often fail under, to, to meet e-representability. So this is, a, this is the kind of graph structure that lasso methods will often fail on. So I want to run through, uh, basically, a uh, simulation of how this would happen, uh, how we would solve this. So you begin with an empty graph or an identity matrix, if you want to look at the uh, inverse covariance matrix of this. And uh, one by one, we're going to perform our forward and backward steps. <coughs> So to begin, we choose the, next, uh, the first best edge. Ah, but we chose wrongly, right? Because this wasn't an edge in our model. So, so even on the first step, we've already made a mistake because this looked like the, the, the best edge in our model. Okay? So it gets added. Uh, we need to optimize our weights. Okay? So during the optimize phase, we're just optimizing the weights of uh, the entries that we have so far in our model. So it's at most, it's at most uh, if we're doing neighborhood, it's at most D, which is D is the maximum degree of the graph. So then we perform backward step, doesn't remove it. Forward step, optimize weights, backward step, doesn't remove it. Forward step, see we still have our, our wrong edge in here. Forward step, optimize. Ah, we've chosen this as a possible edge to remove, but it's decided to not remove it. Forward step, optimize. Okay, now, now that we have all of these edges, it's going to decide that this edge is no longer needed. So this is why we needed to be adaptive and have these backward steps. And so it gets removed, and we optimize, and we need to perform another backward step because we continue to perform backward steps until it breaks. It broke. Okay, so basically we continue in this manner. We learn the rest of the structure. And we return the full structure of the model. Okay. Okay, so let's look at the model restrictions that we have on the greedy methods. So these model restrictions are actually, are actually much weaker than the e-representability condition imposed on the, by the lasso methods. And so the two restrictions that we need are that of restricted strong convexity and restricted strong smoothness. So restricted strong convexity is saying that for any S sparse vector delta, we have that the change in loss between our true parameters and that of adding delta is bounded. It's, we, we, have a, we have a lower bound, okay? So what, what can you think about that? Uh, basically what we're saying is, in any direction, the loss at our true parameters is convex. Okay? And if you think about it, this is a very intrinsic quality to have in these model selection problems, because if it's not convex in every direction, if there's some direction where you know, the loss is just flat, then we could you know, minimize our loss very greatly, but still be very far from the true set of parameters. So if you think about it, this is almost necessary. Without it, you can almost do nothing. So it's very weak. And uh, restricted strong smoothness is an upper bound uh, counterpart. And uh, it's a little more difficult to see, uh, maybe, maybe think about intuitively, but you can think of it as just ensuring that the loss is well behaved. OK, so these are our uh, guarantees. Against persistency refers to uh, consistently uh, recovering the model. And uh, so assuming that our sample complexity scales is order d log p, we allow a min non-zero value of 1 over root d, and, a stopping and assuming that our stopping criterion, which is our parameter, um, is at least d log p, then under this, the global greedy algorithm will learn the true structure of the model, i.e. Uh, the estimated edge set is equivalent to the true edge set with high probability. So we have a similar guarantee for neighborhood greedy in which we have the same sample complexity, same min, uh, min non-zero values, and we assume a similar uh, stopping criteria. Okay, so let's look at a comparison of the greedy methods and the lasso methods. So basically what you can get out of this is red is bad and green is good. So as you can see, uh, the global methods, the global greedy and the, glo and the neighborhood greedy methods, uh, basically we meet neighborhood greedy in sample complexity and min non-zero value and improve upon graphical lasso. And we actually require a much weaker model assumption, okay? This RSC and RSS is much weaker than the e-representability condition. So these methods are actually state of the art in all of these areas. And they're fast. OK, so let's look at our experimental setup. So we simulated structure learning for uh, different graph types and of different sizes. So we looked at this as a chain graph, a grid, and we call this a star graph, where you have a single hub node uh, connected to multiple outer nodes. Uh, and basically what we did is for each graph type and size, we simulated structure learning using scaling sample sizes. Okay. So we began with some number of samples, and as we scaled up the number of samples, we want to look at uh, whether or not we can re retrieve the structure. Um, so for each of these, we ran 50 trials, and we call it a success if we fully learn the true structure, okay? And we call it a failure otherwise. 
So then we averaged over 50 trials, and we take this to be the probability of fully learning the model. Okay, so here are the results for global greedy versus the G-Lasso. So for each graph structure, you can see here, this is the, samples, uh, this, the scaling of the sample size. So, so basically, as you go along the x-axis, you're acquiring more samples. And then over here, on the y-axis, this is the probability of learning the true model. Okay? So as you can see, the, this is the global greedy method right here, and this is the G-Lasso here. As you can see, we require less samples, uh, just as expected, to learn the full model. Okay? And uh, the same is true for the uh, grid case. So looking at neighborhood greedy uh, versus neighborhood lasso, it, it's a little bit of a closer battle. So as you recall, the uh, sample complexities were actually of the same order. So you would expect this to be a, uh, you know, a closer battle. But uh, even in this case, uh, neighborhood greedy actually outperformed neighborhood lasso and required uh, fewer samples, as can be seen in both the chain and the star case. Okay, so to summarize, uh, the greedy methods are state-of-the-art, requiring only uh, n equal to order d log p sample complexity to ensure persistent structure recovery. Uh, furthermore, these greedy methods require a much weaker model restriction of RSC and RSS, uh, as opposed to the irrepresentability condition imposed by the lasso methods. Uh, these methods are fast and highly parallelizable and uh, our experimental results support our theoretical guarantees. And uh, just to finish with, I want to encourage you to use Greedy over Lasso. Right, so, so I mean there's a few things there. For one thing, uh, the analysis follows by the method of doing adaptive uh, forward and backward. Uh, and the other problem is, it, it's not true, I don't think, to say that if we did all our forward steps, just our, and in fact, I, I actually, it's, it's definitely not true to say that if we do all our forward steps, we get all the edges that we need, right? Without doing backward steps. Even, so, even when you're only learning the local structure? Even when you're only learning the local structure, right? You need to be adaptive in doing it <coughs> in order to ensure that you're going to return the full structure. Are there other questions? Have you looked at, like, um, different forward, like, multiple forward, multiple backward? Like choosing multiple edges at a time? Yeah. No, but that's a good idea, actually. That you could, you could essentially, you know, get around some of those problems of, of choosing wrong if you're maybe choosing multiple edges, because if I choose, you know, maybe like uh, the best four edges or something like that, then uh, maybe that'd be good. The problem there is that we don't know, uh, for example, uh, the amount, how sparse the graph is. So if you think about it, what about on neighborhood if, you know, there's only a single edge? Then, you know, on a forward step, you'd be choosing multiple edges that aren't in the graph, and maybe you'd run into some problems there. Uh, so are different initializations, and we always get the same results. Different, uh, oh. I mean, at the beginning, you already choose empty set, right? Yeah, yeah, we begin but with that. If you choose some <coughs> subset, then design to a gradient algorithm. Do you always get the same results? Uh, I don't know. We haven't tried anything like that, so it'd be interesting to try. It's a good idea. And then how do you set your parameter? Right, so we, we give you, uh, well, I won't go back, but we basically give you a bound for how you should set uh, the stopping criterion. Basically, it should be set as around D log P. Okay, so if you set it around that, uh, obviously, maybe you, you have some intuition about what, what these things are, um, but it's just a tuning parameter, really. Yeah. And, and have you tried on really large dimensions? Uh, no, we haven't. Not beyond what uh, we simulated. <laughs> yeah. Are there other Early. Can we go to the next? Yeah. Okay. Let's thank the speaker.